Hello, Wonder Hussy here. Just hanging out in the middle of nowhere in the desert. I actually camped out here last night because I thought I'd be able to get to a very interesting location. Okay, I'm camped out here on the edge of a vast and very desolate dry lake bed called Cuddeback Lake. Cuddeback, C-U-D-D-E-B-A-C-K. Uh, apparently this is, this is the dry lake where Madonna filmed the music video for the song Frozen. Just found that out on Wikipedia. But that's not why I was here. I came over here because I wanted to see an abandoned airstrip where a bunch of graffiti artists painted well, what was said to be the biggest illegal graffiti art piece in the entire world when they did it back in 2015. It's on an airstrip just down that away, but unfortunately, between me and it is a locked gate. Warning! Restricted area! Keep out! Authorized personnel only. And despite what I might think about myself, and despite what you might think about me, unfortunately, I am not authorized to go check out this airstrip, which, I mean, honestly, it'd be real easy for me to just climb through the gate. It's only, I think, less than a mile down that way, but, well, you know me, I'm an honest patriot, and I would never trespass on federal government property because this is part of a, well, on Google Maps, it says it's a wilderness area, but I think it's part of a, an Air Force gunnery range. So not only do I not want to trespass, well, I also don't want to get shot. Anyway, I don't think there's anything left on this old airstrip anymore. This graffiti piece was done back in 2015, and it was a pretty big deal when they did it. It was a group called In Decline that was really active at that time in the Mojave Desert, painting all kinds of large-scale crazy graffiti installations, and some of them were really cool, I thought. I did a video on a couple of them. I did a video on one they did called The Wheel of Mist misfortune outside Las Vegas that's like the giant wheel of fortune from the TV game show only all the values are zero bankrupt lose a job lose a house well they did that back during the Great Recession of 2008 09 uh, in this big old abandoned magnesium mine settling pond and then they did one where they painted a water tank to look like a PBR can I did a video on that anyway they've done a lot of really cool graffiti I'm a, personally a fan of their art and on this giant airstrip they painted and remember this was supposed to be the biggest illegal piece of graffiti art in the entire world they painted the words this land was our land you know like from the Woody Guthrie song this land is my land this land is your land well I guess they were making a statement saying this land was our land until the Air Force took over and blew it all the smithereens you know covered all this beautiful desert up in barbed wire just like the US military likes to do. Anyway, I was just reading about this uh, last night when I got here and found a locked gate blocking me. I thought it would have been cool to park on the airstrip, even though, gosh, the Air Force might have gone in and painted over the graffiti by now. Anyway, I'm not sure. It's been, gosh, it's been almost eight years since they did it. So there's probably nothing left. You can't see anything on Google Maps. I still thought it would have been cool to camp out there, but I rolled up here in the dark stop sign so i just camped over there in the desert but you know i thought it would have been kind of cool to wake up on an old abandoned airstrip covered in the world's biggest piece of graffiti art or whatever was left of it i was reading uh, the guys who did this art piece they had to do it all obviously you know secret they they didn't want the government to know they were doing it so we're real far well we're like an hour two hours from barstow so i think they rented an rv and they brought out like they set up a base camp out here and they covered everything with camo netting or like well, probably camo netting tarps like stuff to blend it in and then it took them something like an entire week to do this graffiti piece because first they had to clear the old airstrip which was completely overgrown it was an abandoned airstrip it was overgrown with weeds and plants and so they used leaf blowers and they dragged a big piece of chain link fence up and down to like tear out all the the weeds and clear the space and then they used god i think they said they spent something like twenty thousand dollars on this graffiti art project because they had to keep going to home depot and buying more and more paint they didn't realize how much paint they were going to need to paint these giant letters i mean it's a full-sized airstrip that says this land was our land and you've apparently you could see it from well i don't know if you can see it from space but you could definitely see it from uh you know thirty thousand feet from a commercial airliner and so i thought it would have been cool to come out here and fly my drone and get some footage of whatever was left of it. Unfortunately, I can't get in, A, and B, guess what? 
it's too windy to fly my drone today anyway. So I'm not gonna be able to see the old abandoned airstrip, but that's okay because I happen to be in one of my all time favorite areas of the desert. It's somewhat new to me. I just discovered this area and there's a ton of interesting stuff out here. So while I can't go see the world's biggest piece of illegal graffiti art, I can go see a different kind of graffiti art. And if I'm lucky, at least one or two other interesting things along the way. So I'm gonna get in my car and get out of this wind and head on to the first thing I wanna check out. Uh oh Okay, this isn't something I was looking for, but how can I pass it up? Some kind of crazy cave dwelling. Obviously man-made though, because look at that nice square-cut doorway. Oh my goodness, it's just one room. And there's nothing in it, except for a whole lot of soot from a whole lot of fires over the years. And this super creepy, witchy looking little broom. Well, whoever was hanging out in here was a good housekeeper, I guess. Okay, onward. All right, here we are. This is the other graffiti I was wanting to check out. And you might be able to tell from the fact that, well, it's fenced off. And the fact that there's one of those signs that says, who passed this way? Please don't erase the traces of America's past. Well, you might've figured out by those two things that my definition of graffiti is somewhat controversial. That's right, I'm talking about petroglyphs. Okay, rock carvings left by the ancient native peoples of this area. And apparently this whole canyon here is just full of inscriptions. In fact, it's called Inscription Canyon. And I feel okay saying the name of it because it's marked on Google Maps and, you know, obviously it's a well-known site. They've got it fenced off. They've even got these giant telephone poles here to extra special keep them off-roaders out. And to be honest, that's sadly totally necessary. Anyway, uh, yeah, I parked and I'm just gonna walk up this canyon and see what kinds of petroglyphs we can find. I mean, it looks like they're all over the rocks up there. If you look, something there, something there, something pretty interesting there. Golly, it's such a mystery trying to figure out what these things represented, you know? My understanding is that when the native peoples used to carve these petroglyphs, it's not an easy process, you know? you. First of all, you have to find rocks that have this dark, oh gosh, I always forget how you pronounce it, desert patina, patina, that dark stuff on the rock, they can gouge that away and leave these uh, markings that'll last for hundreds, sometimes thousands of years. But it's not easy to do, you know, you gotta sit there chiseling away with a rock. And so my understanding was that it, would, it was only done as part of like shamanic rituals, like these shamans, would take, uh, they would eat jimson weed, which is like a hallucinogenic plant, and then they would have these crazy visions and they would uh, etch those visions onto the rocks. That's at least what I was told once by a pretty noted, I don't know what you call somebody who studies petroglyphs, paleontologist? No, that's dinosaur bones. I don't know, but you know what I mean. Anyway, there's no telling what messages these ancient shamans were trying to leave for those of us bumbling around, you know, 2000 years in the future, trying to figure it out. And well, to be honest, that's kind of how I came to my controversial position uh, of comparing this graffiti with that other graffiti on the abandoned airstrip where I camped. You know, the guys who did that graffiti on the airstrip, well, they were leaving a message that to them was just as important, I guarantee, as whatever message these ancient shamans, or maybe it wasn't shamans, maybe regular folks were carving these things, but I don't know, either way, somebody was leaving their mark someplace and they wanted somebody to be able to read it years into the future. Now I will say in this case, it looks like Native Americans won 
indecline zero because I think the indecline graffiti has been painted over and well, <laughs> the federal government is doing nothing but try to protect this graffiti. Oh, look, here's some pretty good stuff up here. It looks like bighorn sheep. They used to carve a lot of bighorn sheep because that was like the, I guess, major source of protein in their diets. Again, from what I learned uh, on this, I took this petroglyph hike once out at China Lake Naval Air Weapons Station, which is a giant secret government base. You're not allowed to go on it unless you sign up for one of these petroglyph tours because they have a canyon out there that's, I think it's considered to be the best collection of petroglyphs in the entire Western Hemisphere. And so they do these public tours every now and then. I took one of those tours and I was lucky enough to be on it with this distinguished professor of petroglyphs. I can't remember what it's called. Anyway, he was saying that, golly, these peoples that lived out here, it's a hard scrabble existence. You know, it's not like there's fruit and vegetables growing on trees out here. Well, I guess vegetables don't go on trees anyway, but well, you know what I mean? Like they would spend all day, every day, just scrounging for whatever meager amount of sustenance they could gather. And you know, I, I, he, according to this guy on the hike, it would be about the size of your fist, what they could gather in a day to eat. And so they basically lived their entire lives hungry, except for when the warriors among them caught a bighorn sheep. And then that was a big cause for celebration and a big feast. And so that explains why uh, these people would go through all the trouble to carve bighorn sheep on these rocks. I mean, if you think about it, people have been carving the same kinds of things or graffitiing the same kinds of things from the prehistoric times all the way up until today. Like, unfortunately, one of the things I see a lot graffitied in abandoned places is, well, I'm going to be a bit vulgar, a penis. I can't tell you how many times I've been poking through some abandoned place and there's a dick and balls scrawled on the wall and you go, oh gosh, you're so immature. But are they really? Because I also went to another canyon full of petroglyphs that in my video I called Cooter Canyon to dodge the YouTube sensors. Uh, it's actually a, a canyon full of vagina petroglyphs, okay? It's a fertility shrine or a fertility canyon full of hundreds, well, maybe dozens of or labia petroglyphs. And so really, is there that much difference between some ancient Native American chiseling a fake vagina into a cliff face and some guy spray painting a dick and balls inside an old abandoned cabin. I'm just saying. I'll also say that this is a really impressive collection of petroglyphs. There's a ton of petroglyphs on almost every rock here. And some of them are really pretty cool. Like, look at this. Here's some more bighorn sheep. I mean, I don't know why. Oh, it looks like there's a sheep up top and then maybe that's a hunter below. I don't know, does that look like a guy's body to you? Anyway, it's not a very long canyon. I and mean, you can see we've already got to the end there. And we barely walked, gosh, I don't know. I'd guess this whole canyon is about an eighth of a mile long, if that. So it's a small canyon, but it's very densely packed with just the kind of rocks that you would want to carve your message to the future in. Oh, here's a really good panel. Now, what do you suppose they were trying to communicate with this. I think this is really interesting because it looks like a Christian cross there at the top. And as far as I know, these native peoples had nothing to do with Christianity. I mean, maybe some missionaries visited this godforsaken patch of desert. We're not too far off the old Spanish trail. Uh, so I guess, I suppose it's within the realm of possibility that some Spanish uh, priest, padre, uh, showed them the cross and it made such an impact on them that they carved this back in well the spanish trail was like 1840s 1850s which would mean that that petroglyph is only about 200 years old 250 years old huh? or alternately it could indicate that the native americans were christian all along and we just didn't know that maybe oh gosh maybe like in the mormon belief the, the mormons believe that jesus christ came to the americas like back in his time i don't know all the details of it i'm not mormon obviously but uh, I guess essentially they believe that the, the Native Americans were exposed to Christianity way before we nowadays think they were. So golly, maybe the Mormons were right after all. Or maybe it's just some totally unrelated geometric shape that has absolutely nothing to do with Christianity whatsoever. And it's all just a coincidence. Either way, there's also all these weird, you know, kind of polka dotty things next to it. And this, I mean, that looks like a figure of a person, a big body. You can see his little legs coming off it little arms and a little tiny head. 
So I'd guess that probably represents a person. And then this thing here, oh gosh, I don't know. These are mysteries lost in the mists of time. We might never know. I gotta go on another hike with that petroglyph guy. Maybe I ought to drag him out here. He'd be able to tell me. Hey, Alan, if you're watching this, call me. Okay, here we are at the very end of the canyon. A uh, few petroglyphs are kind of hard to see because the sun's shining on them. But there is something up here that's kind of interesting. And that is, if you look at this rock, well, it looks like somebody's done, gone, and carved their initials. Uh, I can't quite make out what those initials were, but it looks like somebody named Bob did a half-assed job carving his initials up there. And, well, that kind of brings up an interesting point. Okay, so these rock carvings, or excuse me, not that one, these rock carvings, which I would never touch because the oils on my hand might degrade them, these are revered and protected and they put up a big old barrier so people can't drive over them. But then this guy, just because he happened to come by, it actually looks like it's from 1927. So it's pretty old, you know, almost a hundred years ago, some guy came, carved his name in the rock. Boo, hiss, you can't carve your name in the rock. Well, essentially, what's the difference? Okay, yeah, one was made way before the other one. But now this is in an interesting position because, well, 1927, gee, that falls under the Antiquities Act, which is an act passed by the United States government to protect artifacts left in the desert that are older than, I think, 50 years old? Certainly older than 100 years. So this right here, well, by gum, this is a bona fide antiquity in and of itself now. And so if you just extend that logic, good old Bob's name right here. Well, let's all come back here in 2123, the year 2123. And that'll be considered an antiquity, too. I don't know. These are just the kinds of things I like to think about when I'm roaming around through this world of ours, musing about the types of things we consider valuable and the types of things we consider unsightly. One man's petroglyph is another man's graffiti and vice versa. Although technically, I guess graffiti could only be a petroglyph if it was, if it was carved in rock. Like, how about this right here? Colleen Loves JR wrote that back on January 19th, 1999. Do y'all remember where you were back on January 19th, 1999? Let's all do a thought exercise. Where was I? Oh my God. For me personally, in 1999, January, I was working at Barnes and Noble. Oh my God. How 90s is that? I worked in the music department and I wasn't very happy about it. They didn't turn the heater up very high in the store. I was always freezing. Blah, I wouldn't want to go back. But, you know, Colleen and JR were hanging out here in this beautiful canyon. You know, today's January 26th, so right around the same time of year, it was probably the same kind of beautiful sunny day. Maybe they drank a six pack of beer together. Maybe they made out on this comfortable bed of rocks. Who knows? And who knows if they're even still together to this day? They might be. But my point is, they carved this into the rock almost a quarter century ago now, so. They are well on their way to becoming an antiquity. The only time I really have a problem with more modern petroglyphs over the ancient ones is when they do it like right over top of the old ones. Like this stuff that's written here, I feel like they did that a little bit close to these old ones. Like there's plenty of rocks here, guys. Find your own space. And all of this kind of reminds me of when I went to Chaco Canyon in New Mexico. If you've ever heard of Chaco Canyon, it's a the ruins of a huge ancient mysterious city in New Mexico and there's a lot of petroglyphs there but there's also a lot of carvings from pioneers from the 1800s when they were first passing through that area so it's like you want to go but then you go nothing is black and white in my world Okay, well, that's about all there is to this little inscription canyon. Many ancient petroglyphs, many not so ancient petroglyphs. Uh, I don't know, to me it's just interesting to think about, like, what's the difference between graffiti and art, graffiti and historical record? When does graffiti become part of the historical record? When does graf graffiti become art? Well, you could argue that well, if it's done on somebody else's property, not your own property, then it's graffiti. 
but I don't know. I mean, the Native Americans, I guess they didn't really have a concept of property. So to them, these rocks belonged to everyone. So I guess it wasn't, it probably wasn't see, seen as a sign of disrespect to leave these marks. Like I said, it was like a big deal. The shaman had to drink jimson weed or smoke jimson weed, however they took it and had this whole revelation to do it. So if anything, it was actually a, a mark of great respect <laughs> to have a shaman come carve petroglyphs on a rock. Matter of fact, what if you woke up one morning and there was a Paiute shaman carving petroglyphs into the front of your house? How would you feel about that? Would you be honored? Would you be pissed? Would you call the police? Would you call the newspaper? What would you do? I mean, if you heard someone chipping away at the outside of your house in the middle of the night and you didn't know it was a shaman, I'll bet you anything you'd call the police in a hot minute. Some guy hopped up on gypsum weed carving bighorn sheep and vaginas into the side of your house. I mean, is it really any different from some dude named Kyle hopped up on monster energy drink in Coors Light carving dicks <laughs> into the side of your house? Well, I guess they don't carve, but they spray. But you know what I mean, you take my point. It's just something I was thinking about, and I'm glad I stopped at this Petroglyph Canyon because it did give me a lot to think about as I get back in my rig and cruise along to my next destination in this fabulous, desert wonderland that is quickly becoming my favorite spot in the entire Mojave Desert. Stay tuned.